Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Paul's. Would you please rise and join us for our opening song today, Get Things Moving. Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing And everyone sing Stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He Together we sing And everyone sing Together we sing, and everyone sing. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Amen. Amen. Well, you, be, you may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome to St. Paul's. For those of you who are new or uh, visiting with us today, I want to extend, uh, extend a special welcome to you. Also, welcome to you to those of you uh, on live stream. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. Uh, it's great to be here with you. If you have any questions about today's service or any questions about the St. Paul's community, please feel free to ask me or Pastor Ryan after service. We'd love to meet with you and tell, tell you a little bit more about our community. Well, if you would, please pull out your uh, message notes and connection card. You should have got one on your way in. If you didn't, uh, feel free to grab one at any point during our service. We, these connection cards are a great way for us to stay in touch with everyone. We ask everyone uh, each week to fill one of these out 
just a place to put your name and email address. You'll get into our database each Friday morning. We send out a uh, what's happening with St. Paul's email that gives you uh, just an update on what's going on with the events that are happening and any uh, new items that we have at St. Paul's. Uh, also, there's a place on the back of these cards for your prayer requests and praises. Uh, it's a great way to stay in touch with our prayer team. We have a prayer team who prays over these cards each and every week, and they love to be praying for you. We, we love to be praying for you. and uh, So please be encouraged to do that. And then on the front of the cards is also a place where you could put um, things that you might be interested in, such as baptism or membership uh, or a couple other things on there as well. There's also a uh, virtual uh, connection card in the comments on the live stream if you'd like to fill one out virtually. Well, this week we are going to be returning to our series in the, the parables. Uh, today's message is titled the, Mitch, the Rich Man and Lazarus, and it's going to be from Luke 16. Uh, on your way in, you could also grab a Bible, and if you don't have a Bible at home, please feel free to take one of them with you if you'd like to have one for yourself. It's our gift to you. Now, if you would, uh, turn over to the back of the message notes for the, this morning's announcements. Believe it or not, Christmas is right around the corner. I'm sure you've seen it in, uh, popping up in stores and hearing the Christmas music on radio stations and things like that. This Christmas season, we're going to be participating in a new ministry called the Angel Tree Program. It's a ministry of prison fellowship that helps to provide Christmas gifts to the children of incarcerated parents. Uh, well, I'll be telling you a little bit more about that, but before we do, I'm going to show you a, a quick quick video a little bit more about what this ministry is about when a parent goes to prison families are torn apart and all too often children are left feeling lonely and ashamed the separation can feel even worse at Christmas with Angel Tree you could be the hands and feet of Jesus to hurting families in your community who have a loved one behind bars you can remind children they are never forgotten and it starts with the gift. Angel Tree volunteers deliver a present, the gospel, and a personal message of love to children on behalf of their incarcerated parents. It's amazing to watch how a gift from that mom or dad can light up their child's eyes. For you and your church, Angel Tree Christmas can begin an ongoing, life-giving relationship with prisoners' families. You can help precious children strengthen their connection with their incarcerated parent, grow in their faith, and learn that they are overcomers with great, God-given purpose. excited to be starting this new ministry and uh, in, in the upcoming weeks we're going to be having a Christmas tree up here. Uh, on the Christmas tree will be tags where you could take one down and purchase the gift that the, uh, that the children are, are asking for this Christmas season. And then uh, when you bring in the gift uh, towards the end of the month of November into December, we're looking for a team of volunteers to help wrap the gifts and also then distribute them to the local families. And the neat part about this is it does give us a touch point with the local family in the area and uh, that they'd be welcome to come to St. Paul's just like anyone else at any point. So uh, we're looking forward to that. If you have any questions, you can email Pastor Ryan or talk to me or him after service today. And uh, if you are interested in helping out, if you want to just write that on your connection card too, that would be great. Uh, just a great way, again, to participate in the ministry this Christmas. Uh, our next announcement is next Sunday, November 14th, directly following service. We're going to be having a celebration for Ola, who I don't see in here right now, which is a good thing. We didn't want to embarrass him. But uh, Ola completed his Ph.D. a few weeks ago, and we just wanted... <laughs> It is a big deal. Ola has been a part of our community since uh, he first got to Yukon, and so we just want to celebrate him and, and uh, just enjoy a meal together with him. We have some uh, special uh, meal planned. Martha is uh, helping out with that. So um, if you have any uh, questions about that, we'd love to, for you guys to join us next week. Everyone's invited, and uh, please feel free to bring a friend as well. So we're going to have some soups and some salads and uh, just some like fall, fall foods for after service. So uh, please join us. Uh, it'll probably be up here, and as you can imagine, uh, mask will be probably a little bit more optional as, as we'll be eating. So obviously you have to remove your mask to eat. So, uh, And then the, fi the final announcement is Tuesday, November 19th, uh, 6.45. We've been uh, having a documentary discussion series over the last few months, which has been going really well. Uh, we've, been, we've been loving it as a church, and um, we're looking forward to that. Uh, this month we're going to be watching and discussing a documentary called Send Proof. Um, and we have a trailer for that video now, so we're going to uh, show that video right at this time. 
power of God hit me and I was instantly healed. This man's spinal cord had been severed and he was totally healed. To see a little five-year-old girl that's never heard before when all of a sudden the ears open. That's enough for me. I don't need to see a doctor's report. Jump up, man. Start running. The standardly understood definition of a miracle is an occurrence that has no other good explanation. There are many people mistake things that happen entirely by chance as some sort of miracle. I mean, there are hundreds of millions of people who claim to have experienced divine healing. Are you going to dismiss all of that? My passion has been to bridge the gap between the intellectual and the supernatural. I heard all of these testimonies of people having extraordinary miracles. What I wasn't seeing was objective evidence. So I decided to go find it myself. I just speak to all pain in the shoulder in Jesus' name. Is the pain gone? And I say full healing in the name of Jesus. Why do you think the miracles don't happen when the cameras are on? Some testimonies are false. Some testimonies are exaggerated. Miracles don't happen. The moment you investigate them carefully from a scientific perspective, they unravel. Be skeptical. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. is not a lack of faith. There's power and proof. Two or three miracles are anomalies, but thousands of miracle case studies would change the way we think about the world. So I know when I first saw that, it looked really compelling, and I'm very interested in watching it. Hopefully you are, too. And uh, again, that'll be next Tuesday, November 19th. We meet downstairs around 6.45. We'll watch the uh, video around 7. And then afterwards, we have a discussion about it. And it's, uh, the, like, like I said, the first two months went really well. Uh, this month, we're also going to be offering pizza. Um, so if you would like to uh, participate in that and uh, join in, we just ask that you RSVP. Uh, Pastor Ryan's email address is on the message notes. Just let them know you're coming and let them know you are interested in food so, just so we know how much to get. Um, if you have any questions, again, feel free to ask us. And then the final announcement for this morning is that we, uh, our nursery is back. We have Katie who's here to join us, and uh, it's been great having her with us over the last few weeks. So if you have any children zero to three, please feel free to, that they can go downstairs during nursery, during the message. And also there's uh, some notes in the back um, if your children would like to participate and copy, mes take message notes on their own. We have a child's version of that in the back room. And then uh, this Wednesday, November 10th, 7.15 to 8.15, we're going to be uh, joining, continuing our class for youth, 8th to 12th grade, uh, on the Apostles' Creed, and that is taught by uh, Pastor Ryan and Steve Crosby, who have been working with the, the students over the past few months. You don't have to be uh, a part of that uh, over the, the first two weeks to join, so uh, feel free to join even if you've never come before. Well, at this time, I'm going to ask you again to rise as we uh, have an invocation prayer and also uh, stay, stay risen for, uh, as we continue worship this morning. This, we this week's prayer comes from St. Apollina Onus. O Lord Jesus Christ, give us a measure of your spirit that we may be enabled to obey your teaching to pacify anger, to take part in pity, to moderate desire, to increase joy, to put away sorrow, to cast away vain glory, not to be vindictive, not to fear death, ever entrusting our spirit to immortal God, who with you and the Holy Ghost live and reign world without end. Amen. Before he spoke creation, he 
God of heaven knew our name We're formed in his reflection We are his glory on display And his heart is good He is always kind the cross he proved he is on our side we are the sons we are the daughters of god no matter where we go we're close to the father's heart though we stumble he sons, we are the daughters of God. His love he lavished on us and called us children of the King. Chose the lowly and the weak And his heart is good He's always kind With the cross he proved He is on our side We are the sons, we are the daughters of God Where 
sin runs deep your grace is more where grace is found is where you are and where you are lord i am free holiness is christ in me to you when temptation comes my way and when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay and when I cannot stand or fall on you Jesus you're my hope and stay Good morning. So good to see a full house here today. This is great. Um, just in case you guys haven't seen in the what's happening, um, we do have someone in the nursery now. So if you have a child, three or under, uh, we do have someone who can look after them during the message uh, portion of our service. So uh, if you're watching online and you didn't know that, uh, keep that in mind. And um, yeah, so we're very thankful uh, to have uh, Katie uh, working in our nursery right now. So, all right, so as Keith said, we're continuing in our series on the parables from the Gospel of Luke today. Took a little break last week to hear from our missionary partners, Evan and Chelsea Burgess, which I hope you enjoyed as much as I did. Uh, but we're back in the parables today, and we got a really interesting parable to look at today. It is uh, a challenging parable. It's even kind of a frightening parable. It uh, refers to a place called Hades where there's torment and agony. And uh, this is what's known as the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And there's a lot to talk about here. Um, so uh, we're not going to waste any time. We're just going to get right into it. So if you have a Bible, I encourage you to turn to Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 19. Luke 16, starting in verse 19. Let me pray for us. Lord, we thank you so much for being able to gather together like this, uh, to worship you together. And uh, we just want to... Um, we want to hear from you this morning. We want to encounter you. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be attentive uh, to your words uh, as we read them now. Help us to be open, uh, to be changed by them, to be transformed by them, and to be enlightened by them. In Jesus' name, amen. 
All right. So this is Jesus speaking. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. At his gate was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs came and licked his sores. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, because I'm in agony in this fire. But Abraham replied, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, while Lazarus received bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm that has been set in place, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. He answered, Then I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, so that they will not also come to this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. No, Father Abraham, he said, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. He said to him, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. All right, tough parable. Now, if you've been here at all throughout this series, you know that one of the things we harp on is that if we're going to understand Jesus' parables, we have to look at the context. Who did Jesus say this to? What was going on? And this parable is no different. And what can really help us is just to look a few verses before Jesus gives this parable. If you look at verse 13, this is what Jesus says. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then he makes it very clear what he's talking about. You cannot serve both God and money. The Pharisees, meaning the religious leaders of the time, the Pharisees who loved money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. So right before Jesus tells this parable about the rich man and Lazarus, he rebukes the Pharisees for their love of money. And he tells them, look, if you want to serve God, you can't serve money. If you're serving money, you're not serving God. These things are incompatible. So when we hear this parable, we have to remember, okay, this is a call to the religious leaders, to the Pharisees, to repent, which means to change their mind. That's what repenting is. Change your mind. And if you haven't noticed, the last three parables that we looked at are all similar and that they are all calls for the religious leaders to repent. They're all directed toward the Pharisees, right? Uh, four weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the Good Samaritan, and that was a call for the, uh, a one religious leader in particular to repent of thinking that he only needed to love people who were like him. And then three weeks ago, we looked at the parable of the, of the Great Banquet, which was a call for the Pharisees to repent of rejecting Jesus. Right? Jesus was like their invitation to the banquet, and they were saying, no, we're not interested. And then two weeks ago, we looked at the parables of things lost being found, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. And those parables were a call for the Pharisees to repent of being judgmental and unwilling to celebrate the mercy of God when it was demonstrated to people they didn't think deserved it. Right? So those are the last three we've looked at. And now we can add the parable of the rich man and Lazarus to this trend of Jesus using parables to call the Pharisees to repent. This is a call for the Pharisees to repent of their love of money. Money has become their master. Now, you might remember me talking about this a few weeks ago. Um, the Pharisees had adopted what we today might call a prosperity gospel mindset. 
Have you guys heard this phrase before, the prosperity gospel? Is that familiar at all? And the prosperity gospel is this idea that if you do what God wants, then you are guaranteed to be blessed in this life with health and wealth. So, the Pharisees had taken in this idea, and that meant that when they saw someone who was rich, they saw that person as favored by God. They thought this must be a virtuous person if they're blessed. And if they saw somebody who was poor or disabled, they would think that person must have done something to make God upset. This is the way they thought. So you can imagine how the Pharisees would be reacting as Jesus told this parable, right? Listen to the way it starts. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. So the Pharisees are going to be thinking, huh, there's a blessed man. That's the kind of person I want to be like. Oh, purple linen. Ooh, very nice. You know, purple in those days was very valuable to people. Um, it was a, a sign that you had really arrived and climbed to the very top of the social ladder because the only way that you got purple dye was through this very laborious process of people collecting exotic marine snails and then getting the purple dye from the snails. So it was like, I am so rich that I can afford exotic snail dye. You know, this, would be, this would be a sign of just you know, the highest blessing from God. And then, when the Pharisees hear about Lazarus, they're going to think, oh, this poor creature. This guy really must be on God's bad side, right? It says that he's a beggar, right? So he needs to beg for his food. He's laid at uh, the rich man's gate. He didn't walk there. That means he's handicapped. He can't get there himself, right? He's covered in sores. He, he longs to just eat the crumbs that fall from rich people's tables. It says the dogs came and licked his sores, which if you're a dog lover, you might think, oh, how compassionate of them. But that's not what you're supposed to think when you read this. Okay, the Pharisees, uh, they didn't keep dogs as pets. They saw dogs as unclean scavengers. And so what Jesus is doing here is he's painting a picture that's supposed to fill them with horror and disgust. Right, because there's this man who's starving, and other starving creatures are coming to him and trying to find sustenance. It's supposed to make, make you go, oh, how awful. What a, uh, what a condemned, abandoned man, right? Condemned by God. And then, Jesus takes the story in a direction that the Pharisees would not expect, right? Both Lazarus and the rich man die, but it's like they switch places. Now Lazarus is carried by angels to Abraham's side. Abraham was the father of the Jewish nation. But the rich man is, finds himself in this place called Hades. Hades was the Greek word for the underworld where the dead went. And in Hades, he is in torment. He's in agony just like Lazarus used to be. So, of course, what Jesus is saying here is that things are not always as they appear to be, right? The prosperity gospel is wrong. Just because someone is rich doesn't mean that they're being virtuous. Just because somebody is poor doesn't mean that God has rejected them. Now, some people... I think this is extreme. Some people say what, what this parable tells us is that if you're rich, you're bad. And if you're poor, you're good. If you're rich, God hates you. If you're poor, God loves you. And I don't agree with that at all. And I think it's clear from the parable that that's not true because Abraham is seen in a positive light, right? And if you know the Bible, uh, you know that Abraham in his day was very wealthy, very wealthy guy. So the rich man's problem is not that he has a lot of wealth. The problem is that he loves money, like the Pharisees. Money has become his master. And one of the hints of that is his name. Did you catch his name? 
there is no name <laughs> except for the rich man. Now, why is that? Why does Lazarus have a name, but the rich man isn't given a proper name, right? Wouldn't it be more symmetrical just to say the poor man and the rich man? What's the reason for that? Well, here's what I think the reason is. Because Lazarus has an identity that is not defined by wealth or by the lack of it. But the rich man, the rich man doesn't have that. His sense of wealth, his sense of value, his sense of who he is, is fully defined by wealth. He is a rich man. That's who he is. And when you think about it this way, it's no wonder that he's in torment and in agony, right? Because death has separated him from the thing that makes him him, right? If you were to lose right now the most important thing to you in the world, you would be in agony. You would be in torment, right? The rich man's most important thing is his wealth. His whole sense of self is wrapped up in that. So no wonder at death he's in agony. I'm reminded of uh, the witch in Snow White. You guys probably know the story. Right? Every day, the witch looks at the magic mirror on the wall, which cannot lie. There's a magic mirror on the wall. Who's the fairest one of all? And the mirror would always answer, you. You are the fairest one of all. But then one day she asks, the mirror can't lie. The mirror says, Snow White is the fairest one of all. And then she's in torment. Right? She's in agony. And she won't rest until Snow White is dead. Why? Right? Because her whole identity is wrapped up in this idea that she is the most beautiful one. You know, if she had a name in a parable, it would be most beautiful one, right? And so when she's not that anymore, she's in torment. Just like the rich man. Different identity, same problem. But Lazarus, his identity is rooted in something completely different, right? Not in wealth, not in physical beauty. What is it? Well, the name Lazarus is a clue. Lazarus is short for the Hebrew name Eliezer, which means God helps. God helps. His core identity is that he is a person who is helped by God. How do you see yourself? If we want things to work out for the best in the long run, we need to see ourselves as people who need God's help. And that's not easy for a lot of people to recognize. That requires humility, right? We've got to swallow our pride to say, I can't define myself apart from my creator. I can't do it. It doesn't matter how strong I am, how talented I am, how rich I am, how powerful I am, how beautiful I am. I need God's help. I need God's mercy. I need God's forgiveness. I need God to help me to understand who I truly am. And if I try to define myself apart from him, that leads to nowhere good. Let's talk about this vision of Hades. It's frightening, isn't it? Rich man says he's in agony. He describes himself as being in fire. He's thirsty. There's no water. And he can see Abraham and Lazarus from where he is, but there's a chasm that's separating them that can't be crossed. Now you might be wondering, is this a literal description of the afterlife? Should we assume that all these details completely describe the way it is? And if we're going to take Jesus seriously, we have to assume that. The answer I would give to that is not really a yes or a no. And I know that might sound cagey. So stick with me here. I'll try to explain what I mean. We have to remember that this is a parable, right? And 
All parables are stories that are constructed to make a point or several points. And those points can be true even if all the details are not literally true or, or historically true. That's the way parables work. Now you might say, well, how do you know for sure this is a parable? It might be Jesus just recounting something from history, right? Well, the thing is, it's told in a series of parables. It follows the same format as his other parables. It starts with the same kind of language that his parables usually begin, right? It starts with what? There was a rich man. That's like, there was a man who had two sons. That's like a certain man was preparing a, a banquet. This is the way Jesus talks when he's going to give a parable. So parables are stories constructed to make points where the, literal de the details do not have to be literally true in order for the points to be true. Just like, you know, we don't have to um, assume that the story of the prodigal son all played out like that in a literal historical event in order to uh, recognize that the points it makes are true, right? That God is merciful and that he wants us to celebrate when his mercy is shown to others. Right? So, um, it's important to recognize that. It's also important to uh, recognize that if we do take every detail lit literally, we do end up with a few, a few issues. Like, well, are we really going to assume that people in heaven can watch people suffering in agony? You know, it seems like it would be hard for it to really be heaven if we could see that, right? And then, you know, there's also just the, the fact that in this story, the only people who are mentioned are the rich man, Abraham, and Lazarus, right? You would think if Jesus was intending to give us a literal description of how everything works in the afterlife, that he would mention more people than just those three people in this description. So the fact that there are only three characters, it suggests that this is a parable that Jesus has constructed to make these points. Okay. So, all that to say, we've got to be careful. However, a point of this parable is clearly that there is justice in the life after this one. That's clear. Right? can't get away from that. Those who make money their master will not prosper forever. And those who trust God to help them will not be disappointed in the end. And uh, if any of us have made money our master, this parable should strike fear in our hearts. It's designed to do that. You know, what we see in this parable is poetic justice. It's, so, it's such poetic justice, right? In life, Lazarus was laid at the rich man's gate, which means the rich man must have seen his suffering, probably on a daily basis. He, he walked by the, the Lazarus, <clears throat> He must have known that there were things that he could have done with his immense wealth to alleviate some of Lazarus' suffering. He had to have known that. But he didn't concern himself with that. Right? He, he, he concerned himself with things like exotic snail dye. Even though the rich man and Lazarus could see each other, it was like a chasm was between them, right? Because the rich man would never move in compassion towards Lazarus. And then death comes, and there's a very familiar situation, but the roles are reversed. Lazarus and the rich man can still see each other, only now the rich man is the one who is suffering. And the rich man, he calls to Abraham. He says, tell Lazarus to bring me some water. That line is very revealing. It shows us at least two things. One, it shows us that the rich man knew about Lazarus. I mean, he calls him, well, he doesn't call him by name. He says, Abraham, 
tell Lazarus to do this for me, right? But he knows Lazarus' name. He was aware of him. He can't plead ignorance. And secondly, that request, it shows us that Lazar sorry, that the rich man still really hasn't reached a point of repentance. He hasn't really been humbled. You know, he doesn't say, oh, Lazarus, I'm so sorry that when you were in this situation, I didn't help you. I realize now that I was wrong. He doesn't acknowledge the justice of what's taking place. There's no apology. You know, he doesn't even give Lazarus the dignity of addressing him directly. What does he do? He basically says, Abraham, please get Lazarus to serve me. He still has the rich man identity, right? I get served. That's how things are supposed to work. But of course, Abraham tells him, Lazarus, I can't help you. Between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place. Now, isn't that so fitting? Isn't that such poetic justice? In life, the rich man enforced a chasm between himself and Lazarus. He saw Lazarus' suffering. He was within eyesight, but he didn't move toward him. And now in death, the chasm is set in place. He's been given what he wanted. Right? That's poetic justice. This parable reminds me of, uh, I think, a very profound quote from C.S. Lewis who said, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, thy will be done, and those to whom God says in the end, thy will be done. Right? The rich man in the parable is the second, the second one. His will has been done, right? He wanted a chasm between himself and Lazarus. He wanted his identity to be in his wealth, and he's been given both. If we want to experience real life, real peace, now and forever, the key is to start by saying, God, thy will be done. Thy will be done in my heart. Thy will be done in my life. All right, let's look at the end of the parable. For the first time, the rich man shows something other than selfishness. He's concerned for his brothers. He's got five brothers who apparently are living for money, just like he did. And he doesn't want them to end up in this situation. So he says to Abraham, send Lazarus to go warn them. And uh, Abraham answers, well, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. Let them listen to them. Now, again, we have to remember, this was spoken with the Pharisees in mind, right? The rich man and his brothers are stand-ins for the Pharisees. And the Pharisees, they were people who had the scriptures, right? They were the people who taught the scriptures. They were people who could probably recite the scriptures better than anybody else. They had Moses and the prophets. And yet they had allowed money to become their master. And, you know, they definitely should not have done that because if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you know that it's clear that the poor and needy should be cared for, that money should not be your master. They claim to be people who love and teach the scriptures, to know them backwards and forwards, and yet it hasn't pierced their hearts. And yet, they're not actually doing what the scriptures say. You know, and the rich man, he objects. He says, no, Father Abraham. If someone from the dead goes to them, well, then they will repent. And Abraham says, well, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they're not going to be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. What Jesus is saying there 
is that for those whose hearts are set on serving money, miracles aren't going to change that. You know, we might say, okay, yeah, these Pharisees were messed up, but if they see Jesus do something really miraculous, really supernatural, then maybe they'll repent. You know, something like, oh, I don't know, someone coming back from the dead. And what Jesus is saying is, if their hearts are in love with money, and they're fixed on that, even if that happens, they're not going to change. You know, and we see the evidence of that throughout Jesus' ministry. Jesus does do miracles. He goes around healing people, casting out demons, performing signs and wonders. And what do the Pharisees say? They say, oh, it's by the power of the devil that he's doing this stuff. Right? They find a way to deny the truth that is so plain and so obvious. Why? Because they don't need a miracle or a sign. They need their hearts to change. But their hearts are unwilling. They're in love with money. They're in love with status. They're in love with power. Right? Sometimes we think, I would change my life if God would just give me a sign. You know, if he would do something really exceptional, do some kind of miracle. And again, what Jesus is saying through this parable is, if your heart is in the wrong place, a sign isn't going to make the difference. It's not going to change that. So don't wait for a sign. Right? Don't demand a miracle. You already have what you need to start following Jesus and moving in the right direction. You might see miracles. You might see signs and wonders. But you have what you need now to take the right steps. And you definitely have what you need to recognize that the love of money is dangerous. You know, as we see in the parable, the love of money can blind us to the suffering of others. I've been watching a TV series called Dope Sick. Has anyone heard of this series? Anybody? Um, it's a dramatic retelling of the opioid crisis and how it developed. And it's all about how Purdue Pharma was so focused on making money that they were unwilling to admit how much their drug was causing suffering and killing people and leading untold numbers of people to become addicted. They loved money so much that they didn't care that they were putting people in Lazarus's position, right? That is the dreadful power of the love of money, right? When it's played out on a large scale. But it can be played out in an individual level in our own lives. I know I've gone a little bit long. We're getting close to the end here. Just got to say a couple more things. If I had to guess, most of us probably don't completely identify with a rich man or Lazarus. We probably feel like we're somewhere in the middle of the two of them. But whatever the case, here's what I want us to hear Jesus saying to us in this parable. Two things. Don't let money be the most important thing in your life. And do not set a chasm between yourself and those in need. Now, I realize it can be really hard to apply that second one there. You know, there is so much need and suffering in the world. When our eyes are open to it, it's overwhelming. And if we committed ourselves to addressing it, you know, that could take up every waking moment of our lives. Totally overwhelming. And even when you really want to do something about it, it can be really hard to know what to do. Now, I want to emphasize, none of us can bear all the problems of the world. We can't do it. But we should ask ourselves, is there someone at my gate who could use some help? You know, take stock of your life. Think about it. For the rich man, Lazarus was right there. He could see him every day. But he set that chasm. So who might be in your life who's in need, who's suffering, and you have resources to address that, to bless them.
Take some time to think about that. Another question this parable should challenge us to ask is how much of my money do I give charitably? Now, contrary to what some people think, the New Testament never specifies that you have to give X percent of your income. Uh, it never gives a, a specific number. Um, but it does call us to give. And it calls us to give generously. There's been a long history of churches challenging people to give what's called a tithe, 10% of their income to charitable giving. And I don't think it's good to demand that of people, to be real uh, fastidious about saying that's the amount that God demands you know, that you give. I don't think it's good to be legalistic about that. But I do think it's a good goal. I do. 10%. You know, if when you get paid, you can automatically take 10% of that money right off, right off the top and put it in another account, and it's like, it's like it was never given to you. You just think this is God's money, and I'm going to find ways to bless with that, to alleviate need, right? That, is a, that can be a very powerful practice in your life, a very life-giving practice for you. Here's something to think about. If Christians all throughout America made that a discipline, there would be incredible resources at our disposal. Uh, I was reading about some research that was done in the 90s, so I apologize, this is outdated. I'm sure all the numbers need to be adjusted at this point. But this will help to give uh, some perspective. So in the 90s, a team estimated that 30 to 50 billion a year could meet the world's most essential human needs. And the research also determined that the average American Christian was giving away about 2 to 3 percent of their income. So they asked themselves, well, if we assumed that all the, the Christians in the country upped their giving to 10 percent, well, how much more money would be available? And uh, they determined that that would result in 65 billion more for overseas missions, 15 billion more for meeting the needs of local communities, and all that includes maintenance of current church budgets. So it's just thought-provoking, right? If the church commits to generosity, how much could we be a blessing to the Lazaruses of the world? Are we willing to be generous? And finally, I want to say for those of us who feel more like Lazarus right now, let me close with the reminder of his name. God helps. Life is hard. But you know, however hard it gets, Jesus is saying, God has not forgotten you. Trust him. If you are finding your identity in the mercy of God, then you are better off than the richest person in the world who's finding their identity in their money. Let's pray. Lord, I pray that we really would wrestle with those questions that this parable raises. Father, uh, help us to be generous like you are. Lord, you gave your son, you gave your life to rescue us from sin and death and the devil. Help us to reflect who you are in our generosity as well. Help us to find our identity in you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Lord, all I am is yours. My whole life I place in your hands. God of mercy, humbled I bow down. In your presence at your throne. I call, I call you answer. came to my rescue and I, I want to be where you at your throne I call, I call you answer and you came to my rescue and now I want to be where you service where we continue our worship through the celebration of the Lord's Supper and the giving of our, our offerings. Um, here at St. Paul's, the table is open to anyone who has put their faith in Jesus. And uh, if today's the first day you feel like you've put your faith in Jesus, and you want to believe in Him, and you've never done this before, uh, you can declare that by participating in this. And uh, if you're still on the fence and you'd like to talk about that with me at some point, I'd love to set up an appointment with you uh, to have that discussion and to tell you more. Um, but yes, you don't have to be a member here. Uh, all you need is to have put your faith in Jesus. When we come to this table, what we're doing is we're saying, I want to find my identity in the mercy of God. I don't want to find it in my wealth, or my beauty, or my talents. I want to find it in the fact that God loves me and gave himself for me to rescue me from my sin, from my, my death, and from the forces of darkness. So, as you come, come forward today, think of it that way. You're saying, I know I'm like Lazarus. I recognize that I need God and I cannot define myself apart from Him. And I recognize that Jesus has done what is necessary to reconcile me to God. Um, as of last week, we've changed things up a little now where we are still doing the individual communion cups, but we are inviting you if you are able to come forward. So um, come down this side here and when you come forward, stop for a moment and I will... I'll give you an invitation to receive the elements, and then you can take it, and you can go back to your seat and uh, partake of it there. Um, 
Also, we want to encourage you as you come forward, there is a basket underneath the table and you can place your connection cards in there with your prayer requests and um, your uh, expressions of anything you want to be involved with in the future weeks. Um, and also, if you have offerings that you'd like to give, um, that's where you can put them. So, the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, and he said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you declare the Lord's death until he comes again. And also, if you are unable to come forward, uh, raise your hand once the line has finished, and we will come and serve you. Plunge me in the water, raise me up again. Let me be identified with the man who bore my sin. Let my testimony be the grace should ever win. Plunge me in the water. Raise me up again And I have heard the stories Of the desperate and searching How they stood up to be counted in the service of the king Sin sick and unworthy As they fell beneath the wave Raised up and forgiven Called by name Plunge me in the water Raise me up again Let me be identified with the man who bore my sin. Let my testimony be the grace should ever win. Plunge me in the water and raise me up again. me up again and raise me up again and raise me up again and all of my transgressions and the burden of my past Washed away with mercy, forgotten to the last. Once I was as crimson, now I stand as white as snow. Raised up and forgiven, called by name. Plunge me in the water, raise me up again. With the man who bore my sin Let my testimony Be the grace should ever win Plunge me in the water And raise me up again And raise me up again Raise me up 
up again you rise and join us for our closing song today. Thank you so much for being here with us. And I will remember you, always remember you. I will remember you and all you've done for me. surrounds my soul How you comfort me Heal all my diseases How you lift me up on eagle's wings And I will remember you Always remember you I will remember you And all you've done me. I will not forget all your benefits, how you've chosen and adopted me, often by my sin, your grace has led me and never once have you abandoned me, and I will remain you always remember you I will remember you and all you've done for me I will remember you always remember you I will remember you and all you've done for me I have tasted and I've seen how you follow faithful, how you shepherd those who fear your name. When the shadows start to fall and my heart begins to fail, I will lift my eyes to you again. I will remember you, always remember you. I will remember you and all you've done for me. I will remember you, always remember you. I will remember you and all you've done for me.
thank you so much again for joining us this morning and uh, praise and worshiping with us. We uh, really appreciate it and we hope you have a wonderful week this week. One quick update to the announcements. Uh, November 16th, um, uh, our documentary night, I think it says November 19th on the sheet. It's actually Tuesday, November 16th. Thank you for pointing that out, Doug. So uh, we hope you could join us. Well, we end uh, today's service as we always do. While our service here has now ended, our worship has not ended. Because our worship never ends. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord and to love and serve his people. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.